welcome to Hackney Council's planning subcommittee pre-application meeting. Uh, the purpose of a pre-app meeting is to make planning subcommittee members aware of planning proposals coming forward and we'll have an informal discussion that will take place on the applications on the agenda. We won't be making any decisions um, this evening. My name is Councillor Steve Race. I'll be chairing this evening's meeting. Uh, the meeting will be recorded and is being live streamed on YouTube. The Council has taken part this evening and are present here in the Council Chamber. If any committee members are accessing this meeting remotely, the reminder that they're not Council being present, um, however, they may contribute to the discussion. Uh, welcome to any members of the public and press who join us this evening. Um, while these pre application meetings are open to members of the public, there are no public speaking rights uh, this evening. For anyone joining the meeting remotely via Google Meet, there's a chat function. However, please only use this to raise IT-related issues. As chair of the subcommittee, I won't be monitoring it. Meeting participants are reminded to turn their mobile phones off, please, or put them on silent at least. Um, also, please note that any persistent disruptive behavior will result in you being asked to leave the meeting. In the event of an internet outage, we'll adjourn the meeting and then come back and continue once that's resolved. Um, firstly, I'll turn to my fellow planning subcommittee members and ask them to please introduce themselves. We'll start off with Councillor Narcos at the front. Councillor Narcos, could you introduce yourself? Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm Councillor Narcos. Thank you. Councillor Webb. I am Sarah Young. Um, I'm the Ward Councillor for Woodbury Dale, and I won't be sitting on the actual planning application for this, but I am here for the yeah. Michael Desmond, Councillor Hackney Downs. Claire Joseph, Councillor Victoria Wood. Thanks very much. Um, there are various council officers present in this meeting this evening, uh, both in the room and joining us remotely. We've got Nestle Brom Broughton, who's the head of planning and building controls to my left. Um, we've got um, growth team leader Graham Callan in the team. We've got DM and enforcement manager John Sang as well, who's given his apologies. He's not here, um, but someone else will be, I'm sure. Um, the following council officers will uh, briefly introduce the following. So we've got agenda item five, which is phases five to eight, inclusive of the Woodbury Down estate. And we have agenda item six, um, or a building on land known as the Bishop's Gate Goods Yard. Um, before we will continue, I'll briefly outline how this meeting will proceed. So the planning officer will briefly introduce the planning proposals on the agenda. We'll then hear from the applicant who will give a brief overview of what they're proposing to come forward to a future planning subcommittee meeting for decision. And members of the planning subcommittee will then be free to ask questions of the planning officer or the applicant. Um, please note that committee members will not be voting on any recommendations at this meeting. The final applications will be subject uh, of a report to a future meeting of the planning subcommittee. And finally, depending on how the meeting this evening progresses, we'll take a short break uh, around 8 p.m. We'll now go to the published meetings order of business, beginning with item one, apologies for absence. Please, Gareth. Uh, Chair, so I have uh, apologies from Councillor Levy and Councillor Samatar. Great, thank you. And um, we have Councillor Young with us, that's good. Um, do we have any declarations of interest um, that any members wish to share? No, thank you. Um, we have, uh, do we have any uh, proposals or questions referred to the subcommittee? Uh, none, Chair. Thank you. Uh, minutes of the previous meeting, there are none so far so to look at. So if we move on to agenda item number five, so that's the Woodbury Down Estate and will be introduced and run through by Louise. Thank you. Can we have the lights? All right, thank you. Uh, it's the white one. Right. Slow stuff. Um, so this is the uh, pre-application for the Woodbury Down Master Plan, which is phases five to eight of the development. Um, phases one to four are currently um, either they've either been built under construction or uh, have been submitted for planning permission. Uh, so this development only relates to phases five to eight. Um, you can see them up there. Um, proposing a residential 
led but mostly residential development of just over 3,000 units at this stage. Um, there was a previous master plan in 2014 uh, which proposed 2,400 units for these four phases. Um, so I'm just going to go through phase by phase to give an indication of what is proposed for each one. Um, so this is phase five to the south of Seven Sisters Road, um, to the north of the reservoirs. Uh, the proposal is for approximately um, up to 833 units, which is uh, about 70% more than was envisaged in 2014. Um, as you can see there, there's a um, new road proposed to um, provide access to residents on New Newton Close um, and then the development proposes two 18-storey towers in the northeast and northwest of the scheme. Uh, this is just a um, indication of the proposed heights and massing of the development as it stands at the moment. Um, I should point out there have been some changes made in the um, southeast corner, but I didn't have an up-to-date um, plan, so I'm sure the architects have um, a better one, but there's a, there has been a small change there. Uh, phase six, uh, just to the north of Seven Sisters Road, uh, proposes a new public open space in the uh, west of the site and a smaller section to the east. Um, this also proposes two uh, towers of 18 storeys um, at either end of Seven Sisters Road. Uh, and this is the indication of what the heights would look like for phase six. Uh, this this phase also includes the uh, reprovision of the edge youth centre. Uh, this is phase seven. Uh, proposes a green finger that connects through from the phase five park, which is currently under. Oh, sorry, the phase three park, which is currently under construction. Um, this proposes a taller building of uh, seventeen stories and fifteen stories to the uh, northwest. Uh, 453 units proposed for this uh, for this phase up up from 362 in 2014. Uh, that's an indication again, a slight tweak to that building um, that shows 16 stories. It's now uh, 15 and 17, um, but pretty much uh, as it is. Uh, and then this is phase uh, eight. So this proposes um, 840, up to 846 units, 5% uh, increase on 2014, um, an extension to Rodley Gardens, which is the existing open space in the east, um, and then a central tower of 21 storeys. Uh, and just a final image showing the proposed heights as they are for uh, phase eight. Um, so that's me done. Great, thank you very much. Um, we don't need the uh, lights down anymore. If we could get those up, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, and then we have applicant representatives. Um, I think we've got Martin Kiefer, uh, David Mackay, and Sean Tickle, who will be um, presenting to us. Is that right? Oh, sorry, we've got, yeah. great, we've got we do have another one, that's fine, great. Uh, yes, correct. Off you go then, my case, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll try and rattle through this, I know we think we've got about 15, 20 minutes, there are 32 slides in the presentation, so we'll try and be relatively quick. Right. If I could encourage everyone to enunciate and speak slowly, that'd be great for my old ears, thank you. Yes, of course. <laughs> Um, so Louise has given a, a quick introduction to the, the background of the proposals. This is an outline application that we're putting forward um, for the master plan of phases five to eight that are highlighted on the screen. Um, it is in the context of uh, an ongoing estate regeneration, which has been progressing since the early part of 2000s and has delivered um, numerous benefits to date. Um, some of them are listed on the screen, but um, reconnection with the reservoirs, open space, um, new public facilities, community facilities, and uh, an inconsiderable amount of housing um, to date, including phase three, just under 3,000 homes once that phase is completed. And phase four currently sits with you as an application, and we're looking at phases five 
five to eight. We're very conscious that we're coming in here midway through a uh, master planning process. So while um, we have re-looked at certain aspects of the design, it is very much trying to uh, align with the underlying principles that were established in 2014, and particularly some of the elements of uh, public space and connection with the water and the reservoirs, uh, a new river on the north of the site that will really bring benefit to people's daily lives. Um, because we were relatively new to the project, we've been working on it for about three years now, um, we did start by taking a look back at the history of the estate, um, which is fascinating in its own right. I, I won't go into this in a lot of detail at the moment, but they are aspects of the master plan that are coming forward where we're looking to build on um, the natural qualities of the estate that it has at the moment and those um, particularly the connection with water that exists and is being built on through the early phases, uh, the qualities of the, the buildings that are present in the historical estate and um, the community that has been established there uh, over that period. And you'll see that coming forward in some of the master plan strategies that we'll talk about a bit later on. Um, there is an underlying um, vision to the, the master plan um, that was established prior to 2014 that would be down is an open and welcoming place where people should choose to live, feel safe, and in touch with the natural environment. Um, those are all aspects that we are building into our process and they are informed by a set, set of design principles on the, the right of the screen here. Again, in the timescales, I won't go into those in a lot of detail, um, but creating a place where people can move around easily, where they benefit from uh, new facilities, where they have a connection with the landscape, um, are all parts that are embedded in the, the approach that we're taking. Um, we are midway through a very detailed consultation exercise. Uh, and as part of this, this phase of the master plan approach, we were encouraged to connect with a much broader range of uh, people on the estate and around it. Um, some of those are listed uh, on screen at the moment. Uh, we continue to work with the Woodco board and the design committee as a critical part of our um, design development approach. Uh, at the start of the year held a number of focus groups that have informed um, some of the uh, proposals coming forward and that is about to lead into the next stage of consultation which will be occurring uh, towards the end of this month there are a series of events and um, uh, four events there listed on screen which will be happening in the next couple of weeks uh, up to the start of December. In terms of what we are looking to achieve through the estate regeneration. These are some of the particular aspects that will come forward in the next few slides. Um, but looking at uh, particular qualities that this next phase of the master plan will develop and build on, as I say, those, those early strategies, particularly of creating north-south links uh, across Seven Sisters Road, um, and bringing the, the water that sits on both north and south of the site into um, a part of uh, the daily feature of life around the estate. Um, a lot of success has been achieved with the reservoirs on the south, and we're looking to extend that to New River on the north as part of our um, broader master plan strategy. That also means opening up uh, a greater quantity of public space. There is a significant uplift in uh, public space from the 2014 scheme to the proposals that you'll see today. And that brings it with it other benefits of um, biodiversity net gain, um, amenity space, uh, and general um, the, the qualities that landscape will bring to uh, uh, the overall estate. Um, there is an underlying a requirement to deliver just under 42% of affordable housing on the estate. And while we are looking at, at an uplift in unit numbers in comparison to 2014, that comes with it a comparative uplift in affordable housing. Uh, so what's on screen at the moment is the illustrative master plan that uh, uh, is moment in time and this is the one that will be consulted on in those events uh, at the end of the month and um, this is i think now live on the, the consultation website 
Um, overall, the master plan, as Louise has explained, does uplift uh, the number of houses in comparison with the 2014 scheme. We're looking at uh, a, a number of between just under 3,000 to 3,200. As this is an outline application, that is a range at the moment and will depend on the uh, size of the houses as they come forward in the individual reserved matters applications. And in terms of affordable housing, depending again on uh, unit size, uh, that will bring between 1,200 and 1,334 affordable houses. Uh, that's across both uh, tenures. Um, overall, that, that uh, the broader benefits that we see of, at this stage of the master plan is, is delivering more, more homes, providing more affordable homes under that, uh, that increase. We are securing more public space, as I've mentioned, an uplift from 7,000 to 15,500 square metres. And through that approach, we are retaining a much larger number of trees on the estate. The 2014 scheme would have seen about 30% tree retention and we're currently closer to 60%. Um, the next couple of slides touch briefly on um, the sustainability and background to um, demolition on the estate. Um, this one covers some of the changes from the 2014 scheme, which we are uh, working our way through and aim to deliver improved overall um, sustainability approach in terms of carbon net zero and energy usage on the estate. Um, uh, there are also some of Barclays' uh, priorities that underline the, the, both the design and the delivery of the estate. Um, we have touched on um, housing policy H8 in terms of existing housing estate redevelopment. And there are a number of points on screen. I don't intend to go into this in great detail right now because of the limited time available, but if there are any questions on our approach to it, then we'd be happy to answer them in the Q&A afterwards. But um, we are uh, happy that our approach does satisfy the uh, requirements of the GLA policy HAs. Um, underlying that, because it is a, a demolition and rebuild, um, proposal is review of the condition of the existing buildings on uh, phases five to eight. Um, there is an underlying uh, structural survey that was completed uh, in around 2000 that showed those buildings to be in generally poor condition. Um, that survey is being updated as we speak. We've completed it for phase four and showed very similar conditions to those established in uh, around 2000. Uh, the surveys for the uh, remaining phases are currently underway. And again, from the work that's done today, we expect very similar results. And that's are largely that the condition of the buildings is problematic. There are structural problems, damp problems, and problems with water ingress. Um, in addition to the, uh, the quality of housing that those buildings are currently provided is facing certain problems things around access, not being compliant with current standards, the unit sizes are low and noise and um, play conditions are not great. These are all things that of course a, a redevelopment approach would uh, allow us to correct. Um, underlying that, so in terms of us delivering a, a new build approach on the site, these are some of the uh, uh, principles that will be embedded in the master plan. Because it is a master plan, they're quite high level at this stage, and we'd expect to develop them in detail later on. But just to touch on a few of them, the scheme will um, be net zero um, in terms of its uh, compliance with the GLA and um, WLCCA benchmarks. There is a wider energy strategy, which part of the master plan and um, decarbonizing the energy supply in the state that's connected to um, an energy centre that's been delivered in, in um, phase three and air source heat pumps on phase four. So it's part of a broader picture about how uh, energy on the estate will be delivered locally and at low carbon in the future. Um, there are aspects there in the third point about uh, landscape and the benefits that that can bring, particularly in terms of biodiversity and tree retention. 
And as we move forward, uh, we are looking at certain principles of uh, things like the Letty Design Guidance, which establishes how um, we can control uh, aspects of the design through the design coding process to deliver uh, low energy um, and low carbon usage housing. Uh, so this is the estate as we stand today. Apologies, it's not coming across super clean on the screen. Um, and then the next slide is our as we see it um, upon completion of phase eight. Uh, so what I'm going to talk through is just certain aspects of that design and how they come forward. The first being going back to the principle of the green fingers, which was established in 2014 as a way of correcting various problems. Um, de uh, disconnection of the estate, particularly across uh, Seven Sisters Road. Uh, it's a way of bringing in uh, views from Seven Sisters Road into the estate to to break up Seven Sisters Road as a uh, significant block and then bring aspects of the water at both sides of the estate into uh, both the, the housing overlooking them and the experience within those spaces. Um, as part of our development of this approach, we have expanded the, the space within these green links and uh, particularly in phases six and seven, um, provided better connection through to Seven Sisters Road so that those depths of views as you're moving on the road is apparent and movement throughout the estate is improved. As an example, this space in phase six highlighted here is entirely new to the scheme um, and will provide uh, a part of the, the benefit of moving north to south through the, the estate. Um, that delivering those spaces as much as part of the original design intent is also a key part of how we see people moving around the estate and creating a pedestrian um, movement that is pleasurable to move around and um, a positive experience to the residents is a key part of what we're trying to achieve. That links in with um, creating public facilities that are easy to get to, be it the shops in Central Square, to pick up your cup of uh, your pint of milk in the morning or getting to the school entrances um, or accessing some of the community facilities like the Redmond Community Centre um, at the bottom of Spring Park. Um, it, it, there's, we've considered this very carefully in terms of how these routes are activated and made safe through um, uh, activation of the buildings around them, through creation of good quality public space, and uh, eventually, uh, which uh, through things like positive lighting, uh, which we, we would control in the application through the design code process. Uh, one thing that is integral to this is delivering the crossing points on Seven Sisters Road. There are two new crossing points that align with the green fingers here uh, and here um, and that's part of uh, something that we're working through with TfL um, who hold control over Seven Sisters Road to ensure that they are delivered and stitched into the master plan. Um, I won't dwell too long on this but just to pick up on some of the work we do with the design committee uh, one of the things we have looked at quite carefully is things like walking times uh, what's on the screen is uh, the walking time for an elderly resident. Um, this is looking at an average walking speed of a 60-year-old uh, and how they would get around the estate and to all the key locations. Um, we consider in how we're doing this their options of routes, um, whether or not they're direct or uh, through some of the more pleasurable landscape spaces, but also time. And how this comes out is that the uh, the estate is not a 15-minute piece of city, it's an eight-minute piece of city that from anywhere within the estate you're able to access, in this case, the central square and the facilities around it, but that also goes for aspects like the schools and community centres and uh, sports facilities that the master plan will be provided. Riding. Um, Again, apologies, it's not terribly clear, but there's a, there is a mix of um, two particular things on the screen in terms of how the master plan contributes to facilities and community spaces. Um, in pink, which doesn't come up totally clearly, are the um, 
the buildings which will contain community facilities. This is looking at the estate as a whole at its completed point. Um, the most significant bit of that for the, the master plan coming forward is the edge, which is an existing um, uh, youth centre that currently sits in phase six, which we are looking to relocate as part of the overall strategy and part of a, um, a community centred approach to this uh, green link through the middle that sits on uh, this corner in here. Um, outside of that, we're also looking at the design of the, all of the landscape spaces and how we can deliver facilities that will provide um, low cost facilities for the local community, uh, be that from um, uh, community planting, which we're looking at focusing in uh, uh, phase five, but we could also have kind of smaller satellite pieces dotted around the master plan. Um, to uh, um, play spaces and MUGA spaces. Um, there are two MUGAs that are proposed as part of the master, wider master plan um, and things like uh, walking trails and biodiversity trails that we'll come on to and talk to about in a minute. Um, as part of that and looking at the, these green links in a bit more detail, we are starting to think about the themes about how we can focus individual spaces within the master plan. And this is part of the work that we're doing with a company called DPQ, who have led a lot of the focus groups and consultation. And this is how we'd look to build in aspects of heritage um, and um, uh, community uh, history uh, into the overall estate. Um, there are some examples on here, but again, with short of time, I won't go into this in more detail. Uh, this particular slide looks at um, integrating the estate both with the wider area in terms of walking trails and um, but also how we can provide things like exercise trails which would be a feature of um, a new exercise loop that would be accommodated within the master plan it's the blue loop uh, that is on the screen that would come with exercise pods um, and something that we're looking into with the parks team at Hackney currently um, in terms of the overall heights approach, um, we, uh, as has been established, we are looking at greater density, um, but we're also looking to um, blend the, the housing approach in with heights that have been established on the site. Um, there's been a general strategy of stepping the buildings down towards the uh, water's edge, be that north or south, and so the existing buildings step down from uh nine seven and five stories of that kind of scale and we're looking at taking that approach and expanding it across so in phase five we are stepping down to the the waters we are slightly taller than those buildings a story taller um but uh taking a similar approach here and on the north side where we're stepping down to uh, new river and the boundary with harringay um Along Seven Sisters Road, uh, there's been a long held intent to create a more boulevard approach to that street. So we're generally looking at a more consistent height. That's the buildings in pink, and they are broadly aligned with the proposals for phase four that have come forward. Um, there are then uh, points of height within the master plan um, at key locations. Those are generally um, in the, the region of about 18 stories. Um, that's lower than uh, the, the cluster of towers around the central square, which is 26 to 31. Um, and it is intentionally a kind of secondary height um, so that we're not competing with that central cluster in the broader um, uh, townscape picture. Um, there's detail of all of the block heights through there, but I won't go into that now. Um, this is just showing the development of the design through the approach over the past uh, six months, uh, evolution of the scheme in terms of providing that extra open space and also how the number of homes has come down through conversations with the design officers here. Uh, originally, we started off at three and a half thousand homes. As we said, we're currently at a maximum of 3,200. Um, that height strategy has been developed with a lot of input on uh, microclimate uh, from sunlight studies like the ones that you're seeing on screen at the moment that look at 
This particular one looks at sunlight in public spaces and how we can deliver um, above the uh, guidance, BRE guidance for two hours of um, sunlight. This is a mid-year condition and of course would improve in summer. Um, that's one part of it. We've also looked at uh, in the sunlight within the, uh, the uh, communal spaces, within the streets and within uh, on adjacent residents as well. As, um, wind has been a, a long-term issue uh, with the development of phase four and was something we looked at very carefully. Again, where these are uh, CFD studies that we're undertaking at this stage to ensure that the development can come forward and be successful in terms of the quality of the um, public realm it's providing. Um, the last few pages here are detailed studies on each phase. So they look at the individual plots together with some um, uh, illustrations of the type of landscape we're looking forward. And that image in the bottom right is actually a view of the phase itself. Um, I'm conscious that I've probably exhausted my 20 minutes. So um, happy to talk through these or uh, take questions as appropriate. Just a request for me, could you go back to the tower heights, please? Um, yeah. Just that slide that we skipped over. Thank you. Could you just um, explain what the tower heights will be in the new phases compared to what they were in the previous must plan? Um, so that varies across the piece. Um, there were points of height allowed for in uh, various phases, it's safe to say gen phase five generally envisaged lower buildings and we have one story of uh, one tower of 18 stories, which is the one on the corner here. Uh, phase seven across the way had in 2014 a 17 story um, building that was on Seven Sisters Road itself. Our maximum height here is now 16. Uh, and we've pushed the height away from Seven Sisters towards the back where it has less um, townscape presence and daylight and sunlight impact. Uh, phase six, um, there was a taller building on the corner uh, at this point here, 18. which was, we think, 18 stories. And so it was in, aligned with where we are currently, that's similarly 18. Um, in phase eight, uh, the taller elements were actually located on green lanes. They were around this uh, junction here and they were up to 20 stories and um, we're currently at 14 stories there we have a taller building of 21 that sits more central within the phase that's been led by some extensive townscape work to find the best um, the location where it has really the, the, the least impact on the surrounding area and in terms of overshadowing on public space Oops. Great, thank you. Um, oh, there's a question, Gareth, yeah? Uh, I, yeah, I yeah great. Question. Okay, let's um, get the lights up, yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, questions? Very good, Councillor Joseph first, then Councillor Desmond. Uh, Councillor Joseph, take yours. Thank you, Chair, thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, so my first question would be for you guys, the applicants. What's the rationale behind this? significant increase in uh, density. Thanks. Is that working? Uh, yeah, hi, so I'm Tom and I'm with Barclay Homes. Um, we're in quite a challenging climate at the moment. Uh, we've moved on quite considerably from where we were in 2014. Um, and then again, we've seen quite a significant shift from where we are where we were in 2020. Um, so we're looking to provide more homes at this stage. You know, house prices are steadily increasing, but the build cost is increasing at quite a significantly higher rate. Um, and we are still committed to providing that 41.7% affordable. Um, and that is funded through private delivery. Okay, thanks very much. Um, it's great that the 41% um, will continue um, in the, the kind of uh, rejigged figure. What's the 10 year breakdown going to be between shared ownership and social housing? 
Uh, so that is 57% shared ownership and 43% social rented. A figure then for the number of social homes in these proposed in these phases. I saw that one coming, so I do. Um, that will be up to 574 social rented. So um, across the whole of the master plan from the start, um, that will be up to 1,228 affordable rented homes. Perhaps um, officers could help me with the, so I've seen two figures widely quoted for the initial numbers of council homes on the estate. It's a difficult figure to get. So I've seen 1327 as well as 1458. And I just wondered if you would have that figure. Um, I don't at the moment. I can have a look while you're Thank talking you. about it and see what I can find. So that's the current houses on the estate from five to eight. With the initial numbers of council homes before regeneration began, because that's sometimes a figure that we don't always agree on. All parties can't seem to find, because I think it's important to, to know if there's going to be a decrease or if there's going to be an increase or if it's going to remain the same. Thanks. I, I don't know whether I can jump in there. Is that okay? Um, in terms of floor space, we will be over providing um, from what was there um, when the regeneration started in 2009. Um, you know, whilst the unit numbers may not marry, um, we are providing significantly more family units than there were. Um, and they are now all of um, significant size, whereas before there, they were under the nationally described space standards that we're working with today. What would your figure be? Do, do you have figures for the numbers that you believe are on site initially and the numbers that you will provide? Uh, again, we've not been able to narrow that down. I know that's one that is just back and forth, essentially. Okay, Councillor Joseph. <clears throat> we paid a, a visit to the site and it seems to be progressing very well. Um, when was it? Two months ago? Three months ago? Time flies when you're involved in mayoral by-elections and other things. Um, I wanted to ask whether all residents will have access to all facilities, because it's very important to this committee that there shouldn't be any dislocation between the different forms of tenure. And could you also clarify what the heating systems will be within the individual units? Um. Yes, I think there's, there's uh, in terms of everybody having access to all facilities, we take a tenure blind approach to the estate. There are um, there's some fine detail of the requirements of the PDA in terms of where we locate individual tenures, but there is no reason why uh, um, tenures would not have access to all the facilities being created. There is an uh, we have a mix of um, public open space and communal space within the scheme, communal space being that shared by the residents of the block rather than the residents of a whole. So within a, an individual set of buildings, um, if you took the space contained centrally within them, just those residents would have access to it as we are doing in phase four. But the public space that is throughout the scheme, and that's where we've seen the significant uplift, everybody would have access to. And the second question in terms of the heating systems. Um, so the uh, the approach to heating on the state has changed um, since the original phase of three application, which envisaged a gas-led CHP approach. Um, that energy center, while it will still exist in phase three, will now be fed by air source heat pumps. Um, those air source heat pumps are proposed to be located on phase four. Um, and they, but they will feed the entire development. Are you happy, Councillor Desmond? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Right. I think I had Councillor Posse yet, but can I see your other hands up for the next round? Yeah, Councillor Nichols, Councillor Joe. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Um, on phase eight, I think previously we talked a bit about um, the potential to do some retrofit. Um, and, I, and I missed start the presentation, so I apologise. I missed what you laid out, what was going to go on that side. So I just wondered um, whether there's any elements you know, that you fully explore the option for retrofitting, at least in part, as well as to give a great example or an opportunity to show how it can be done if the buildings are suitable. And the other thing I was wondering about was the wind. So I know there's a lot of thought goes in, into, but inevitably around tall buildings, you do end up with the wind tunnel effect. Now, we've talked about this previously in planning committees, um, but then anecdotally residents very often say, well, it is quite windy here. So can you describe your approach? It'd be really kind of reassuring to know how you're mitigating that in quite a lot of detail. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll go with the wind first. So uh, through the design process, we do um, various different types of study. We start off looking at CFD analysis and that progresses on to full wind tunnel testing. We have a, uh, advisors called RWDI who um, uh, take us through that in quite a lot of detail. Wind tunnel testing is the, the most detailed way and the most accurate way of pre uh, predicting the outcoming uh, wind results. What the early studies have shown us is that, if I go back to that page, uh, I'm trying the right one. Um, by and large, the, the early studies show that we are um, getting uh, passive, what's called passive to active, um, call it wind conditions around the estates, apart from in a a few locations where we have edges that are exposed so particularly this section up in uh, the top corner where you've seen the red spool coming off the buildings and we also have a bit of it happening in the bottom right hand corner um, elsewhere we are kind of aligned with the, what we'd expect the wind conditions to achieve on site and um, that coming about for a number of reasons partially because the testing doesn't take into account um, the trees within Finsbury Park, which do break up the airflow, and also this particular one that was tested is a lot taller than the scheme that we've got in front of you today. We actually had a tall building on that corner, which is part of the reason why we re relocated it away from that position. Uh, generally, in terms of the master plan, the taller buildings are taking an approach of being um, set within lower blocks. So uh, that means the building, as it comes to ground, is quite often uh, you have a, a, a lower building, nine storeys, which is then set back with the tower coming out of it. That helps us with the downflow coming off the buildings where they're capturing the wind. It's then distributed at roof level rather than coming all the way to the ground. Now, these are things that we would look to pick up as we write the design codes for the estate, that while we can't know all of the details of that building uh, as it stands at the moment, um, we would ensure that it's written in such a way that the condition, expected conditions are established and these basic approaches of just setting buildings in and dealing with corners are written into the um, uh, future RMA applications. Okay, yeah. great, Councillor Young. Can I pick up that? Um, so just to say, um, shows on the screen that there are a number of people watching on YouTube. I'm aware that there are a number of members of the Woodbury Down community organisation watching um, on YouTube. So you do have members of the community watching. Um, I understand and I've experienced myself uh, walking along the um, walking along the existing street in the middle. So that is Lordship. Park, Lordship Road, I can never remember what, which one it's called. Um, and it, by around sort of Skylark building, it's actually extremely windy. I've had plenty of stories of people being either nearly blown over or blown over, perfectly hale and hearty adults. Um, so I know that your wind analysis shows there's not a huge problem, but the word, word on the ground is that there is. Um, when we did the detailed study for phase four, um, the wind tunnel threw up when testing on the existing condition that there were safety exceedances around the base, particularly not of Skyline, but of Residence Tower on the corner that we know mm -hmm. to be an issue. 
Um, actually, the phase four development did reduce. It slightly improved those conditions. They will still be windy, um, but there was a slight improvement on it. Why that was helpful for us, that it was reflecting lived experience on the estate. And so when the, when the tests are being done, they're not throwing up different results to Good. what we're expecting. That's great. Uh, so just on this sort of what the residents call the Manhattan effect, um, in the middle, if you go to the, not the wind picture, but the main looking at the estate picture, um, that's it. So uh, I don't, it's kind of not that clear on here, but Seven Sisters Road runs through the middle of the estate. And for anyone who doesn't live around here, Seven Sisters Road is an incredibly wide road. Um, so this looks like, oh, there's just a street up the middle. It's not just a street. It's a very, very wide road. Is this plan showing Seven Sisters Road as after narrowing, after the TfL plans to narrow it, or is it showing it as it is now? Um, so no, this, we, we're aware of the work that's going on with TfL and whether or not the, uh, the proposal to narrow Seven Sisters Road from three lanes each way to two mm -hmm. is actually deliverable because of it's part of the connection into mm -hmm. the wider area. For our perspective, we have to deliver what's within our control. Yeah. So um, the red line boundary for the site goes up to the back of pavement. Um, the things that we need to consider are how the buildings interact with the street. So mm -hmm. we're making sure that we've always got significant setbacks to create the trees that um, would bring a bit more life to certain sections of that road, which are missing at the moment, and ensure that they've got the scale that's appropriate to what is a 40 meter wide road. And um, we are working with TfL to try and deliver those proposals coming forward. Uh, the money has actually already, finances have been committed yeah, yeah. as part of the development. Um, that said, to our mind, the most critical first step is the crossings, because really that's how uh, the, the, the primary aim of reconnecting the north and south will be delivered, and they have a huge benefit. Um, so, so. so as the, I know this is a master plan, not a kind of detailed, you know, there will be this tree here type plan, but um, as this picture shows, the, the current phase three, which is in the process of being built, kind of, right up to the pavement i don't think there is room there to put trees in so i'm just wondering whether this the plant these plans will have the building set back a bit further so there is room to tree line that as kind of but shown on it they do um the exact quantity is we're still discussing with um our landscape designers to make sure that they've got sufficient space to grow the trees the, at the scale that is required but each all phases have currently it's a six metre setback from the back of pavement. Um, if the future scheme for Seven Sisters Road is delivered, that would be enhanced further by the fact there'd be wider pavements and the uh, uh, cycle lane along the north side as well. I've got three more questions. <laughs> okay. um, the first is, um, in phase six, I think you've got Woodbury Grove North forms part of phase six. You mentioned the Edge Youth Centre, which was built as part of the regeneration and might move. Um, is there anything proposed in here in terms of whether that housing, the existing, uh, I don't know if it's Edwardian, housing along Woodbury Grove North will remain or be moved? Or are you leaving that open at the moment? Not moved, demolished. <laughs> um, so the master plan does take that, as, as 2014 did, mm -hmm. does take that area into it. So. Um, the proposal for phase six would see those houses incorporated into the scheme. Okay. Um, and do these, this is a totally different question, do these proposals allow for designs which might um, allow for deck access rather than entirely internal corridors? Um, they, that would be possible through the... Um, uh, through the mechanisms of the RMA applications in future. I would say that generally deck access housing is less efficient in terms of form. It has some other benefits. And so what you might see if that type of housing was to be delivered extensively, though that total unit number might fall down. Okay. So if the feedback from residents now is that the new housing with the internal corridors is a bit lonely, as, as well as being very overheated. Um, what would your response to that be in terms of future designs? 
Um, so it's something that we, we looked at quite carefully on phase four in terms of avoiding unlit, lengthy internal corridors. Um, we took an approach firstly to get daylight into all of the spaces and to get view out. And then rather than long corridors, uh, circulation, so the lifts were positioned centrally with small clusters of front entrances located off. So there was um, a bit more commonality to individual locations within uh, the housing design. So we, I think it's always likely that these buildings are, are going to be pushed to come forward in efficient forms. That means you know, up, up to eight, eight, eight apartments per, per floor. But there are ways to deliver that that is not the lengthy, dark sure. corridors um, that you might have seen elsewhere. Thank you. Last question. <laughs> uh, just picking up on the um, questions that Councillor Joseph was asking around um, uh, the principal development uh, agreement on uh, the amount of affordable and social housing. Um, this is a question for Barclays, I think. Uh, do you see any scope for um, sort of negotiation or adjustment of that balance between social rent and affordable homes within the 41.7%? Uh, we've been looking at that with the delivery partners over the last few months and haven't necessarily come to any conclusions on it. Um, we, we can pick up those discussions again, but for the time being, we're working with those PDA splits, but to amend the tenure split within the 41.7% would be challenging um, if, if you're talking about uplifting affordable rented. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Before we go on to Councillor Nurkos, some hands shot up. Was it a supplementary to that specific question, or do you just want to come on different topics? Councillor Bosley. Say by retrofit. Okay, fine. And then Councillor wanted to ask a bit more about the wind. Okay, um, we'll come back to that. And then, anything on this specifically? Okay, yeah, can you just do the relevant one? Because I want to get everyone in, and then we'll come back and do the second round, is that right? If it's relevant, do it now, yeah. Um, oh, I just really like to kind of, since we're here at the pre-application stage, just kind of really emphasize that, as you must be aware, this has caused quite a lot of controversy being council state that's obviously had such a long regeneration and is potentially, although we haven't heard the exact figures, not actually going to reprovide all the council housing that was there. Although I do take the point that you say that you're, you're doing an uplift in sort of square metre, but um, we kind of had to take your word for that because the details are not, not there and it never seems to be provided so I think when you bring the application all that detail would be really useful in helping us kind of make our decision and I'd just like to kind of support what Councillor Young was saying there about you know if there could be any um, consideration of an increase in social homes that is what we really really, really need in this borough um, and obviously if you're increasing the overall number it would be lovely to see your figure at least match what was there initially. Thanks. Councillor Narcross. Um, yep, to my question is about car parking. So phases uh, six to eight are car free with the exception of phase five. Um, I was just wondering um, in terms of phase five, what the rationale for having car parking on that one is um, how, and sort of what that provision will be and how it sort of relates to kind of current provision. So there is a principle for returning residents that if they have car parking, um, permits that they are allowed to retain them. That's part of the underlying agreement on the estate. Phase five is the envisaged to be the last phase where existing residents are relocated. That increases the requirement for parking in that phase. So as phase four, it is um, uh, basically the current standards that are in your policies, which is car free, with the exception of returning residents. Right, Thank you, Chair. Um, it just seems that with the, I mean, I know it's BEP and it's massive, it's a massive development, and so there would be uh, concerns, but there does seem like quite a gap between um, the concerns, fundamental concerns of our officers because of the nature of the tower blocks and the overbearing concerns. And I just wondered if there was any wiggle room because I'm not quite sure how much, you know, there is between the heights of the uh, towers proposed and what's going to come eventually and how we can avoid what the officers are, are, are worrying about, which is you know, the overbearing and the, the kind of general darkening sounds of, of 
um, perhaps it, the next part would be what um, are the design, I mean, are we going to see all units as to whether or not they get sunshine? I mean, just not, uh, just, not just the open areas, but actual units. There, you know, I mean, how many units are not going to have sunshine? And and uh, any, uh, are we going to see the um, idea of dual aspect as well for all units? Thank you. And um, so, just a little step back. The one of the things that the master plan delivers generally is wider open spaces and streets that were then were. Um, uh, proposed in 2014 so while the scale of the buildings has increased as has the gaps between them and um, views out resulting from that so we we do various things as part of the design development to ensure that daylight levels who uh, within the buildings um, are, are going to be to a good standard clearly we can't because we don't know the layouts at this particular moment in time and um, we won't be able to review the details of the interiors, but we do um, analysis of facades to make sure that the amount of sunlight hitting that facade will deliver uh, the quality of apartment behind it that can achieve all the standards and provide good places to, to live in. In terms of dual aspect, um, that's one of the kind of key things that's changed really from 2014 and the uplift in expectation. Um, we we do uh, we envisage trying to get as close as we can to um, uh, high levels of dual aspect. It's not always possible. There are locations where we will have single aspects to deliver an estate of this density, but um, they should be balanced against having good views outside and still maintaining those high um, daylight levels that we think we can achieve at this level of density. Thanks a lot. Uh, wind, Councillor Um Yeah, just in terms of the Boulevard, Surfing Sisters Road, and your work with TfL, I just want to sound a little bit more about. So you're talking about the, those buildings on Surfing Sisters Road are going to be quite tall. Um, I, I hear what you're saying about the trees, but you know, with a lot of tall buildings along the road, you are going to have a significant. If my understanding of my basic signs, you have going to have the potential of a significant wind tunnel effect. So can you describe how you're kind of, you know, mitigating that? And I really would like an answer on whether you've considered for Rowley Gardens, the because that just seems to be the Nord for some reason. I really Sorry. would like an answer whether you, you have considered uh, that we, for the final phase. We weren't ignoring that question. I just got yeah. uh, taken over by others. Um, in terms of the wind on Seven Sisters Road, um, unlike... Um, the central square which when we've done the analysis has shown to reflect a problem and um, the analysis that we've done of seven sisters road doesn't show there to be a uh, a current problem along that street nor one in the future now that will need to be developed a long time more uh, with more detailed testing as we go um, a full wind tunnel test will be done prior to application. It does take the outline massing because there's no detail and you'd expect in the future for that to be improved upon when the detail of the buildings comes forward. As you move from simple planes and uh, blocks of buildings to more um, basically rough facades that actually uh, lower wind speeds. So um, all I can say at this stage is that it's not it isn't being raised as a particular problem in the work that we're doing but we would continue to monitor it and as i say where where we can do simple things to deal with building heights and their potential impacts on streets they are being incorporated into the design okay it's just back to the point that's been made previously where you know it has been said that there isn't an issue and obviously i don't know if the rugby tells it is so i think it's important we know it's like that so just to my company Thanks a lot. Um Elsa Joseph, next one. Oh sorry. So just to just to just to come back on the retrofit point. Um obviously we've looked at the issues of retrofit as part of policy H eight and London plan. Um certainly for phases five, six and seven, it's it's 
is very, very, very difficult because of the nature of those buildings. We looked at it as part of phase four. We've been continuing to look at it at phase five, six and seven and, and eight. Um, it's very difficult because of the nature of the, uh, the, as Martin was saying before, the nature of the existing buildings is very poor. The space standards within those buildings is, is not great. Um, there's some very, some many structural issues as well that need to be resolved. So certainly for phases five, six and seven, which are sort of much older buildings, uh, we don't think there's, there's any significant opportunity there. And this certainly isn't by looking at, we've looked at extensions, we've looked at infilling, we've looked at all the different options. It doesn't, it doesn't deliver the, the objectives of the Woodby Down Master Plan, it doesn't deliver quality homes. Uh, phases eight is slightly different in terms of its nature of the, the, the plan form and the buildings, but it does have some inherent issues as well in terms of the nature and style of those buildings. And in order to be able to deliver the, the the quantum of development that we need to be able to deliver the number of affordable homes and to deliver the quality of the open spaces um, it will be a challenge to do that obviously that's the last phase and it may be something that we can review as we go through the master plan we're in our third master plan now um, and each one has taken something from the other ones and and, and taken something in terms of the the changes that have happened in legislation and guidance etc so we'll we're, 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 we're always listening it's going to be extremely difficult, I think, to be able to deliver uh, a retrofit scheme and deliver the objectives of what would be done. Yep. Bring my microphone on now, please. <laughs> uh, my voice is quite loud. <laughs> In terms of, you know, the master plan, presumably you're coming up with the massing, all right. So, you know, it sounds like you're making a decision at this stage rather than really being able to review it later on unless we do another scheme. I don't know if you'd have any comment on my comment. <laughs> and, no, we are currently in the process of doing that exercise on phase eight. Uh, as um, Sean said, we, we've uh, we previously looked at the other phases because they're all quite similar. The, the building pipe is quite similar and the problems that are quite similar. Phase eight is very much its own thing because there is more space around those buildings, but we still envisage a similar set of problems. That said, I, we won't preempt it. We'll do the study. We'll share it with your officers and, and then perhaps with you at the, the, the right of opportunity. Thanks, Councillor uh, Joseph. Thank you, Chair. Um, just sort of having a more detailed look at the, um, the report, um, 5.8 mentions the commercial strategy, which I think is forthcoming. Um, so officers have mentioned that you haven't kind of noted any um, any other uses, uh, such as sort of shops, um, GP surgeries, things like that. And with such a large increase, I guess, in density, those things are going to be really important, aren't they, for people? Um, so what, what are the plans in the pipeline there for amenity? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, so we're not proposing any, you know, classic town centre, um, your old A1 to A4 uses as part of the master plan. Um, from 2014, you know, shopping patterns have changed. Um, so we're looking to focus a, a lot of the retail opportunities in the heart of Woodbury Down as part of phases three and phases four, where there is a lot of footfall. Um, there is 6,700 square metres of non-residential which includes commercial um, and community already built or proposed um, or being built as we as we speak so we're only proposing to provide up to 950 square meters of community floor space as part of this future master plan which we envisage coming forward in phase six um, to take on your point around um, gp surgeries etc um, to date we have made payments as part of 106 um, towards healthcare facilities. Um, we, we do have mayoral SIL um, and SIL contributions fund those items moving forward. But um, to date, you know, we've been paying through our 106. Yeah, can I, can I just follow up on that? I suppose um, the funding is all well and good and part of the package, but if there's no effort to go, then, you know, it's not, you're not building communities on that space. I think it just sort of ties in, if, if Councillor Joseph doesn't mind, just to follow up to the question. I'm a bit concerned about the fact that um, phase five in particular and sort of phase eight feel quite, um, you know, there's, there's no, there's no um, 
development there for anything other than housing. And so, you know, you talk about shopping patterns have changed. They absolutely have, but it means that in many ways people are, um, shopping patterns are much more um, dissipated. So people prefer to kind of wander five minutes away to go to a shop to pick up a few things rather than go somewhere specific um, further away to do a big weekly shop, for example. And so, um, um, we'll go on to phase five. I want to ask a few questions about phase five in particular, but but I I, I, I don't take your point in a way about um, about sort of providing Merrill still at ASEAN section one hundred six because you know there there will be no opportunity for those facilities to go anywhere in these um, buildings because they because they're not being provided. The space is not being provided. Yeah, so we'll, we'll do a social um, infrastructure assessment as part of our ES. Um, at the moment is noting that we're not having ad any adverse impacts um, we were asked to provide a healthcare facility in phase two um, but the NHS never took that on so that is now a um, local employment business um, opportunity where I know the neighbourhood office is. Um, we did have a map earlier in this document that probably didn't show up too well on the screen um, but even if you take phase eight so if you take phase five, um, even at the furthest distance away, you'll be within a five minute walk of, you know, a convenience store. Um, they are along Seven Sisters to the north. Um, there's not a great amount of footfall there. Those, those uses aren't um, performing very well. Um, and again, if you look at phase eight, you know, whilst you are eight minutes to the local center of um, phases three and four, you are a two and a half minute walk to the facilities around Manor House um, and you're a six minute walk to the large Sainsbury's up on Harringay Green Lanes. Um, what, what we don't want to do is, is put in facilities um, for the sake of it. What we would like to do is actually have a thriving heart to the community um, in the centre of the scheme. That sounded like I was going to say more, but that point is done. <laughs> Fine, thank you. Um, can we just talk about the um, the increase in density? Where where are you? Where is it mostly going? The increase in the density is it in that phase five? I can think in terms of the change five, actually, from my previous phase five is probably the the largest uh, uplift in height. Yeah. Is it possible just let's get back on the um, PowerPoint to phase five? You had it on here, I think, didn't you? Um, actually, the, sorry, the, the slide further along with the numbers on uh, per the buildings has been more useful. Sorry. That's the one. Great. Thank you. So, so phase five has much more of the density, doesn't it? It looks like, because I think my right in saying that they used to be between sort of six and ten mostly, but now they're, you know, sort of between eight and it looks like 18, is it? Uh, yes, 18 at the tallest. Second? 18 at the tallest, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so one thing is that, that uh, compared to other phases, this phase doesn't look very nice, actually, I think. It's, it looks quite cramped. It looks quite, um, quite a lot of the blocks are quite big. Um, there's a bit of stepping back. It's quite hard, I think, to, to sort of envisage it on the PowerPoint. There's no model or anything. Um, but I suppose from your perspective, then potentially from officers' perspective, um, what's the what's the thinking behind this phase in particular? I think which sort of overlooks the sort of reservoir and the and the road. So, I mean, what's the what's thinking behind the the quite significant increase in density at this phase specifically? I mean, we one thing we haven't included in this presentation, but has been done, are low level views of how that massing presents itself and how it sits within the wider area. Um, we, we, as I said, we don't have that work here, but we, it has been done. And we think while the the heights are, uh, they are an uplift from what we were, what was envisioned in 2014. When you look at the scale of those buildings and how they sit, they actually sit very comfortably along the reservoir edge. Um, the, the heights are broadly aligned with the, um, the, the building which sits just to the, the right hand side here, which is 11, 9 and 7 stepping down towards the reservoir. Um, that uh, is actually slightly closer to the reservoir than we will be. We have an increased setback. So uh, at 8 and then stepping up from that point, 
Um, when you look at that in its, its immediate context, it does come across very comfortably. The uh, taller building on the corner has been part of recent discussions with design officers, and we have put forward a proposal to take that down in height so that it matches the other height, um, heights of buildings along that phase. Um, we generally do try and push the height um, towards the north side where it has less impact on um, the green spaces, particularly the uh, we have two green figures in this phase, the one that's coming forward as part of phase three, the new park, and then there's a green finger on the right hand side that connect onto um, the uh, housing that is has been recently consented in this location here. And that, that delivering that green link in that location is part of us being neighbourly. Um, in the previous approach, the buildings actually backed onto that and provided a rear, a rear elevation towards those buildings, whereas we're providing a much more positive engagement with the, uh, the buildings that are coming round. Um, it is tall. I mean, generally, I think 2014 anticipated the scale dropping off here, um, but that uh, on the flip side has given us, I think, the ability to target this revised um, density level, um, uh, uplifting it as a way, in a way that we think is actually quite comfortable when you do look at it from street level. Thanks. Um, and then with regard to the rest of the mass fund and how it was meant to look in the first place, obviously you had the central core talk about the fact that the, um, the taller tower is meant to be in the middle as sort of signposts towards the sort of heart of the um, development. We've now got quite a lot of dissipated sort of height all over the place, slightly. So you know, you've got sort of um, quite a lot of height in the north. Well, now now my geography is going to go off uh, along uh, just north of um, Manor House. You've got quite a lot of height on, on the far east and sort of phase five and north of the um, Seven Sisters Road there as well. So what what impact does that have on the on the look and feel of the entire? Um, development uh, 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 what you originally envisaged and what you wanted to deliver so in terms of the, the buildings along seven sisters road i think it was always the intent that there would be buildings of height on corners and locations where you are entering into the the green spaces that was true in 2014 and is largely true now phase six um, and phase five we are our taller buildings are located on the corners that demarcate entrance to the green links. The one exception to that being phase seven, where we have moved that taller building back towards the north, where we think it has less um, landscape and less um, microclimate impact. Um, that sits alongside uh, an approach where we have been very mindful of the, the way that the taller buildings sit within the broader townscape. So there's an extensive study that's been done about townscape um, views through the view city model from uh, 50 locations circa around the borough, um, taking into account things like views from Finsbury Park, um, views from the north as the, the land drops down. And in certain locations, we have moved height away from edges particularly in phase eight, uh, where when we started this proposal and um, in some of those early schemes, we had a taller building on the corner, uh, as part of the marking the entrance to the estate, but whether or not we, we actively needed a tower in that location to mark that entrance is something that we went through quite extensively with the design officers. So we've had to come, we have come to a more, I think, nuanced position of that, where it, it's, it is in places about uh, picking up on certain key corners and entrances, but in other locations, it's located where it's more driven by townscape and microclimate review. Okay, thanks very much. Um, am I able to ask officers just about um, the sort of where we're headed with this new master plan versus what was submitted and um, what the sort of major changes are from your perspective, and whether in terms of the density in particular, I think, and whether officers currently have a view. Are we able to do that in our preamble? Um, in terms of density, I think um, from my um, presentation, you can see that it is quite a lot um, denser than it was before. And we um, we do have concerns, I guess, about the height um, in general. Um, there have been comments about the open spaces being larger, which they think they are compared to 2014. 
um, but they also need to be larger because there'll be more people on the um, within the development. So it's not purely a kind of we're providing, I guess, bigger open spaces because we want to. They do. They do need to provide bigger open spaces. Um, so yeah, there is um, there is quite a difference between the density of the scheme and the density of the twenty fourteen master plan. Okay, thanks so much. All right, I think you know the, uh, more houses is is obviously better when we need more houses, um, and driven by economics, it's fine. But um, we do want to make this the best possible development can be for people who want to live there and um, make it as attractive as possible. I think um, just in terms of phase seven, I know officers have written in the report that um, the open spaces are not um, not looking too. Uh, good in terms of their sort of um, being overshadowed and um, tight. Um, I think we want to see sort of open spaces that are particularly sort of usable by residents. And I think sometimes we don't get those. Um, Councillor Webb, yeah. Thank you, Joe. I just want to come back and collect Joe's point, which is really key. I mean, it's just really important about um, GP surgeries um, because um, in Hackney Wick, we've had a lot of new build, a lot of new residents. They go to the local GP. The local GP says that they cannot deal with the demand or within the space that they have and put in terrible planning applications, Chair, to have GP extensions in porter cabins on the one green space that's in the area. This is what's going to happen. I do appreciate that you might have talked to the NHS, but it's a very large organisation. And you may well be talking to someone that doesn't particularly get GP need and requirement. We can see what's coming in. All these people are going to come in. Where are they going to go to the GPs? Our staff, Hackney staff, Hackney officers take on this responsibility of trying to assist the NHS and GP set, um, revision. And they've been dealing with the, the problem that we have in Hackney Wick, you're going to have the same problem here. Um, so please do link up with um, a Hackney officer that deals with GP provision because it's ridiculous to wait for it to be a problem. Deal with it in advance, Chair. Thank you. Can I ask a more targeted question yep. on the same point? Yeah, go ahead. Um, are you talking to the John Scott Health Centre about the fact that ultimately they will have to rebuild? Uh, about they'll have to what sorry so on amenities in general um i think it wasn't mentioned that the children's center is already being rebuilt that skinner's school has already been rebuilt and that the local primary school roles are falling not rising and i think the council is also looking at possibly building a new library but on gps um, there is pressure locally already and right on the edge of uh, Woodbury Down Estate is the John Scott Health Centre, which I think was the first NHS health centre in the country. Um, it's a 1920s, 1930s building that I think ultimately will have to be redeveloped in some way. It's not within the master plan area. I just wondered if you are having any conversations with them as part of this project to look at whether they can expand their uh space to take in more patients uh, we haven't been today but we can do thanks very much and then just final from me um just on um phase five a note that there's a disagreement about the tree the lime tree and that there's now it seems to be that it's newly on the site of a category a or category b um uh, lime free um oh, uh, i mean obviously there is a lot of history um with um uh, amenity trees on this site so why is this ended up here um and what's the proposal for this in the future i suppose uh we had our arboriculturist go back out again um last monday and he reconfirmed that it was a category b tree um i'm came onto the project in January. I'm not personally sure why there was confusion as to whether it was A or B, um, but it, it was classed as B before and it's classed as B today. We'll be retaining, retaining all class A trees. Okay, whether it's category A or category B at the moment, the plan is to chop it down, right? And build on the sites. Essentially, in short, yes. Um, but it, in retaining that tree, 
um, we lose in, in, in the region of 150 homes from phase five. So um, we're looking at it on a planning balance in this case. Okay. Um, any other questions? Yeah, final word, Councillor Joseph. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I just wanted to kind of echo what Chair was saying about the height. I mean, the report, we, di we didn't really completely <laughs> interrogate officers' reports, but they did say that there was a risk to townscape harm from some of the heights. And I'd be quite concerned about overshadowing of any green spaces um, and just creating a really kind of unpleasant enclosed feel really in some of those areas. So I would personally urge you to consider rethinking. Um, but just very quickly, just on what we were talking about, local provision, um, I think my colleagues have covered the um, NHS doctors and healthcare, but um, dentists is also really big consideration and you might I don't know if you've done any research into that provision but we've got residents that haven't seen dentists in years just because it's so difficult to find an NHS dentist now and um, and I think with this influx of people um, there'll be a lot more pressure there too so it might be something to consider looking into and if there could be someone on site I think that would be really beneficial just on the um, commercial strategy, I don't know, is when does that, do we ever see that or what's that, well, how does that link in with the uh, master plan? Can an officer answer that for me? Um, we should see it at some stage and I think the ground floor one um, on commercial uses we're expecting to see soon, um, but the community one we are hopefully seeing soon too, but I think that's less clear about when exactly we'll get that. But we would expect to have it before the application Kevin. Great, okay, look forward to seeing it. Okay, um, great, thanks so much. The vision is great, let's make sure we can deliver on that um, as near as possible within the confines of what we're currently working within. But thanks very much for your time, it's been really um, helpful, really interesting, so thank you. Um, I think if you could um, quietly vacate, that'd be great. Are we doing people staying still because it's not a, um, or do you want well, them to move? Well, well, I mean, would it be beneficial for the representatives from Bishop's Goods Yard to stay there, or do you not believe? I them can off? see them better because I don't have to look through uh, oh, okay. various well, cameras just, and things. So well, if you're welcome, mind staying there. That's fine. Yeah. As long as as long as the committee are okay with that, because um, obviously you're a bit jealous. I'm, I'm just the chair, and obviously just Jonathan, gentleman with the glasses. Oh, the remains that's fine. Sorry, can I stay there? Oh yeah, okay, yeah. Let's take a very quick break, a toilet break, um, okay. if people want to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.
I'm a fan of them. I suppose. Sorry, just one minute. Great. I think, I think we're all back. Thanks for getting the lights, Nick. Um, we're moving on to item six. So land known as Bishop's Gate Goodyard. This is uh, one particular building on that site. And we are being led by uh, multi-talented light dimming and pro, um, PowerPoint giving Nick. Um, Bishop's Gate Goodyard is the uh, northwest corner of this site. It's above the Shoreditch High, High Street station, the pot one that we're talking about now. Um, plot one, northwest corner, as can be seen here. The hybrid application, sorry, the hybrid application allowed details of plot two, these elements here. We've been discussing with the GLA over the last year, approximately, with Tower Hamlets as well. Plot one is one pre-app, and basically the rest of it is another pre-app. Just to go through the photos of the site, Bethnal Green Road, a bit further down, Shoreditch High Street Station. This is looking west over the whole of the site. Our part of it, plot one, is the furthest element on the right there that you can see. So the reason that this is coming when the GLA will be deciding the application is because the design code that was approved at the time of the hybrid application has certain elements in it, like maximum and minimum parameters, that need to be changed a little bit for this application when it comes in. The current proposal that we've got, um, I don't have any better images than this. I'm sure that the applicants will do when they talk it through. But this is the uh, the latest version of it. So with, there's been some discussion in the report that I sent through about different options. The GLA have confirmed that they're cautiously backing this option now. So the um, discussion that we have now should be up to date about the maximum minimum parameters. And I'll just go through that really briefly because the applicants will talk to it themselves. But it's such matters as with outside the maximum parameter, you'll see a lobby area here. This is a northwest route. So there's um, a helpful thing there for um, putting a lobby in and uh, activating that northwest route a little bit. Another thing that you can see here is out inside the maximum parameter, sorry, outside the maximum parameter, you've got an additional floor space here. Minimum curved corners, little indented bits for retail space. And this part here, which is a little grill above the same thing here, detachable grill above the, um, the, the railway box. So not huge changes. And we're discussing here the NMA, non-material amendment, rather than the design of the scheme, which will be decided by the GLA. I'm gonna hand over to the applicant. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, so I've got a reasonably short presentation, which will be get behind within 15 minutes. Um, as Nick outlined, this is for plot one of Bishop's Gate Goods Yard. It's the building here in the middle of the screen. It's a number of things. It's an opportunity to contribute towards an amazing vision for the Goods Yard, which, which goes all the way from Shoreditch High Street all the way down to Brick Lane, and for commercial street, commercial road all the way to uh, 
Bethel Green Road. It's really complex. It's really, it's, I've been doing it a long time. It's probably the most complex thing I've ever worked on, particularly in this sort of environment. Um, it has the overground station running right through the middle of our site. And when the overground station was put in through our site um, a number of years ago, it took out some of the what is now listed wall that surrounds the site. So this, this scheme needs to do a number of things. It needs to work in and around and over the station, and it needs to create for our client, our joint venture client, really good quality office space that sits above that. We've been working with a design guide, design parameters, um, and there's a couple of, sort of consented diagrams. So top left, this idea that really the building splits into layers. It splits into a base layer, um, a sort of plinth base, which respects the existing wall of the good yard. So it picks up on the language of the arches of the good yard, it repairs that, it brings it back to life. We don't want it to be a pastiche, but we want it to be a nod towards what was always there. And then a plinth, and the plinth sits between levels two, uh, one and level four, level five, really. Um, and that's as a masonry building. And that is the part of the building that really contains what is fundamentally a bridge that spans over the station. So everything within that is a structure that works, which is around stepping across the station, stepping across the station viaduct and the station box, and coming to ground where it can, with very limited places where we can bring foundations and cores down. And then above that, try to create a really efficient office building. And we think when we look back at the history of the scheme, it has a sort of resonance with the memory of the site. But this idea that the goods yard was there, the images on the right hand side, it was always a masonry base. It always had a warehouse sat above it. They were two different architectures coming together, but working really in parallel. The thing we have introduced is this gap that sits between the top and the bottom of the building. And the reason to do that, and we'll talk around the evolution of that as we go through, but the reason to do that is whilst north-south, the structural gift prints of this building align, so we're going on a nine metre one way and a seven and a half metre the other way, the reason to do that is to reduce the overall tonnage of steel in the building and to make sure that we can make it as carbon positive as possible. But actually, when you look at the west elevation of the building or the uh, east elevation of the building as the model here, the grids don't align. So you can never get the top and the bottom of the building to marry up. They never come together in the same place. So actually, the gap is a reason to, to really see how these two pieces of architecture sort of coexist together. And you see, there's also other places across the site where, where this happens. So on plot two, which is the building to the right, the uh, Eric Parry building, there's a sort of super sledge of structure that worked in there. And, and so we're picking up on that. We have a truss or a series of trusses that run between our levels four and five, which do that transfer across the station. The other thing that's really important to say, and part of the reason to find a uh, well, to have a discussion about amending uh, some of the maximum and minimum, param minimum parameters in the NMA is whilst the building goes through, it changes in height all the way through. So the, sorry, the, the uh, station viaduct changes in height all the way through, and it also curves. So it doesn't do any one thing in, in any one particular way. And I think when the parameters were set, they were set in a fairly simple way, which didn't allow for the evolution of the building as we have it. So we've been 11 months through a sort of series of uh, options, really, from the illustrative plan application in 2018 up to our sort of draft stage two report at the beginning of this year, where we started the process uh, with, with both of the boroughs. And I'll just step you through some of those uh, conversations. So in pre app one in January, we'd already settled on the idea of the masonry base, the metal top of the building, the slot in the building. Um, and there was a lot of conversation around the plinth height being too low in respect to its relationship with the T-building on the north side of Bethnal Green Road. We brought it down low because it had a relationship with the structure, but also brought it down lower because it, we thought it gave sort of reference to the T-building sitting on the north side and opened up the corner. The major problem here was actually that we put balconies and terraces into the west elevation and made, you know, I think everyone thought it was, it was too busy, it was too active, too much was happening. So we, we talked a lot about how we might pair that back. We did also invite both of the boroughs to our studio to talk through the model in a workshop, a sort of a, a, a unofficial workshop. Is actually the thing about this scheme, it needs to be seen in model form, not just in physical model form, but in 3D model form. I don't think we were able to unlock this as a, as a project. We were able to really move around it. There was a lot of focus on that image from uh, 
uh, Beckham Green Road and Shoreditch High Street about how the building looked specifically at that point. But actually, this building is you resolve one corner, you need to resolve the other, and you move around. It's a complex 3D problem. I would invite you uh, to walk around the model. We also talked about the base and how to make the base feel like it had this sort of notion of shortage. How, so we did a lot of studies which aren't part of this pack, which is looking at bays in shortage, corners in shortage, how buildings, particularly masonry buildings, came to ground. What we do have at level one is quite a unique uh, position on Bethnal Green Road, where we're bringing all the cycling, all the cycle parking up onto level one. So uh, you come in, you arrive, there are both ramps and lifts to take you up to a level one. It gives us a great opportunity to put naturally daylit, naturally ventilated cycle parking uh, at level one, which we think is a really good amenity for the project. We then went on to pre app two, and there was a number of things that were, I think, genuinely widely um, appreciated the scheme. One was this idea of curving the corners. We talked a lot about particularly curving a corner to Bethnal Green Road, um, which is one of the things well, under NMA we talked about later, which is coming inside the maximum parameters, because how we felt it benefited the public realm. And also how we then looked at the south corner and changed the stairwell by the Oriel Gateway, which is actually not part of this plot, but how it begins to work in tandem with this plot to bring you up at a level and bring you onto the park, which runs across and all the way down to Brick Lane. But there was a conversation about elevating the bit of the plinth, and you'll see that on the right hand side. How could we begin to make the plinth work and come higher so it fits and respects the maximum parameters as set out within the uh, design guide. And you can see here the very real problem we get when we try and bring those two pieces together. And you'll see it a little bit further on without a gap. So then we went to the design advocates meeting. We went with a scheme that was pretty much based on the uh, scheme of the prior slide, um, but really reintroducing this gap. So we were still holding on to the plinth at level four, the gap at level five, and the building above. But we also had made significant inroads in terms of the way we dealt with Middle Road, which is the new road in the master plan, which runs east-west on the southern side of the building. And you'll start to see some images here in the middle about how we're trying to deal with the station as it comes out, because that we feel strongly that the station is part of the scheme. It needs to be respected. You need to understand it. It's not an accident. It's there. And also how we deal with uh, the requirement to potentially have additional station entrances as the uh, passenger flow increases. But also then what we do about that north-south connection between Bethel Green Road and Middle Road. You see the image on the right is just uh, was how that was at the time. And then we went to pre app 3. And pre app 3, again, we're still trying to work out what we do with this additional height at level 5. Um, and where, what we, where we were here was we realized you can't connect level four and level six physically because the structure doesn't work. It just doesn't read. Um, and we were trying to create the gap rather than elevation, but create it in plan. So we were effectively trying to slide the building, the top part of the building, down behind, for better, better word, a colonnade at the upper level. So there was a crown to the base and the other building slid down behind. And I don't think anyone felt particularly comfortable about it. And you can see on the right hand side, a little sketch, just this idea of where the, um, where the trusses still sit in the building. And we worked that through again in, into the following pre-app. Uh, we had other options, options were coming in, options were going out, pre-app four, I think we had three options on the table. But we really sort of, I think, honed in at that meeting that you really can't begin to connect the buildings. So where we are today is there was a uh, was a proposal which had the shoulders to level four, but our proposal now is to take the shoulder level up to level five on the right hand side, create the gap at level six, and what what well what was mezzanine and six will now become six and seven. So the double height gap is uh, all the way around, and then the uh, the metal top, if you like, of the building just continues above that. So we've just been changing playing portions of it and you'll see again on the model um, that steps as it goes down Bethnal Green Road and you see here just on the right hand side the proposal how that feels in middle lane how it begins to work to sort of create that sort of vista down down middle lane this is looking west to east and then this is Bethnal Green Road back from by the Huntington estate 
um, you'll see the sort of step in the elevation as it comes down, it steps down from level five to level four, which is within the maximum parameters, which is within the guidelines set out in the design guide, that step, because actually we have really significant double height trusses, again, which we'll see on the model, double height trusses on the east end of the building, which really can't be sort of brought into a typical floor plate. And we have uh, terraces. I think it's worth saying we push very hard to try and understand where we're providing excellent quality workspace. And one of the things we think is vital going forward is providing uh, naturally ventilated or, or spaces where they're open to terraces on every floor. So every floor of the building has access, access to terrace space. And just to touch on those minimum, and these are so fine that I, I won't label them too hard, but so this is where we're outside the maximum parameters. Um, and what you'll see is we're proposing to extend the maximum parameters to the edge of the station box internally. This has no effect on anything in terms of where you, you view the buildings from the outside. But what it does allow us to do, it allows us to build, we have an offset from TFL of two meters, which we have to respect. It allows us to build a temporary closure to close our building to the station box. Otherwise, without doing that, we can't, we can't effectively put a gasket around the building and bring it close to the station. So you'll always end up with this sort of ugly gap in the building. And also up here, um, actually, next slide, up here you'll see this very minor amendment to the maximum parameters, um, which is about when the maximum parameters were set, there was no way of getting upper level and the bottom level of the building to sit uh, completely um, flat in elevation. And I think we, we spent a lot of time going back and forth with both of the boroughs and with the GLA talking about simplification, how we make this building feel a little bit more simple. There's a lot of time has gone into really just aligning grids by sort of you know, 800 mil. But that, so there are very tiny things. And I'm sorry, I should have said on here as well, the other thing that this maximum parameter would allow us to do is internally. So this is a slight change to the internal building. It will allow us to open up and use a little bit of this space through the lobby to allow this lobby to animate a bit more. I think we're quite concerned that, and I think everyone's quite concerned that this north north south connection can be accessed from public to walk through. It's very much like the T building. You, you, it's a lobby you can walk through, but it has a station that runs over the top of it at 4.3 meters above ground. So we wanted to, rather than create a sort of tunnel above, under a viaduct, we wanted to make sure we've got a little bit of space to create animation, whether it be a coffee shop or a you know, news agent or something in there just to give that, that lobby a little bit more space. And then that was the issue in plan. We have the same issue in section. We really need to change the maximum parameter to bring it close to the station box again, so we can just get that area of closure. And you can see Nick mentioned earlier, um, in here, you know, we need to be able to set back a grill that can, can close the station. And there is a minimum, um, which minimum is a slightly odd thing, again, not something I've encountered very much, but um, we do have some points, minimum and maximum on the same line, which is sort of almost impossible, but uh, where we want to curve the corners, technically we have to come back and just look at uh, changing the minimum parameter to curve the corners of the building, which I think everyone feels widely is the right thing to do. And also we will need to change the minimum for the loading bay, which is inside the belly of the building, just so again, we can turn trucks. So that's, that's before and after, so you can just see. Also the, what the minimum does allow us to do, so I should have said here, um, we, we've been quite conscious about trying to open up and create great spaces of public realm, you know, and actually going into reducing the minimum allows us to squeeze in the building slightly. So at certain points like this, which is underneath the viaduct as it comes out of the building on the west elevation, we can set a temporary uh, space, so a temporary sort of F and B space, so there can be a sort of cafe or something in there that people can use the shelter of the viaduct. So it becomes a really sort of positive space. At the moment, it's a really, really negative space, and actually, it will then lead you directly to the staircase, which I showed you earlier, which takes you up onto the onto the higher level, onto what, what's called platform level. So you can see this is the maximum parameter. We're totally within it in section, apart from this, which is proposed 400 millimeters move in on the west elevation. Just so again, so we can animate that slot that sits at level six and seven. So you can actually read it and has a slight overhang. It doesn't sit completely flush. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much.
Um, I think this is relatively um, complicated um, for us. Great. Um, <laughs> can I um, just, before we get to, we'll take a look at the model in a moment, but um, Nick, can you just um, clarify for us uh, where we're at with the options and whether that's relevant anymore, which one we're looking at per the report? Um, and what specifically is within the remit of this um, committee this evening? Presumably it's around the plinth um, height and it's around the um, minimum and maximum uh, kind of parameters. But if we can have it very clearly set out, that'd be great. Thank you. So on Friday, after we'd written the report that you've seen, the options were narrowed down to the one option. And that one option has the higher plinth. So to answer the last question first, the higher plinth now means that it's within the agreed parameters. So we don't need to consider the plinth. So that was something that was a live issue. And it was a live issue for us all the way up to last Friday. But now, all that we need to consider really are the things that have been outlined as within the minimum and maximum parameters. So it would be curved corners, the lobby space, the little bit that goes inside the, um, goes closer to the TFL infrastructure. So one of the questions that I'm sure the applicants would be interested in after this is now that we've come to this more um, defined point, we have a, an option that we used to call option three, but is now the only option. Would the committee be interested in seeing it at a later stage or would you be happy for us to have a look at it under delegated authority? Because we now have fewer things to, to discuss. But. Okay. So sorry, so we've got curvature of the... Um... Okay, so shall I just go through that part of it? Yeah, thank you. Would you mind doing it on your slides? Sorry. Because it's quicker. Yeah, just go to the... So, yeah. so on here we've got uh, the bits in red. You've got the north-south route, so you've got a lobby being created off there. You've got um, some bits around the side that will give some space for additional... We'll give them additional space, which previously were, I imagine, considered a little bit too close to TFL infrastructure, but the actual zone that you're not allowed to build in is only the two meters, so they're not going to go inside that. Go down one. Um, you've got your... Uh, yeah, and there's the, the little bit at the top there, which allows them to make their grid um, better in the facade. Uh, down one again. Uh, did, did we go the same way? Down another one. I'm looking for the elevation, basically. There we go. Um, you've got a floor there inside the maximum parameter. And down one. Curved corners. Little insects, if you could point to them, where you could get some retail opportunities. <coughs> and uh, if we go into the elevation, just got that little bit there which allows definition on the front so just the blue bit that is up. you happy with that summation yeah no i think it's very clear i mean just just again on the on the piece that's in the inside of the building Sorry, on the piece that's in the inside of the building what we're looking to is increase the maximum parameter to the edge of the tfl box but the TFL box has an offset of two meters. Yeah. So we're not ever going to build to it. It just allows us to simplify the parameters. So where we put in temporary structure to be able to close temporarily the gasket, which I'll point out to you in the model, it, which will have to be removed. It just can be done without breaching maximum parameters. Okay. It's a very detailed question. Do we want to look at the model before we ask questions? Great. Before um, we ask questions, can I just ask questions to actually understand you your, where this is? You through your microphone. So, just so I understand where this is, and I'm picturing it correctly, right? Um, so this is the area, I, I think my colleagues just clarified, this is the area that is box parked, yeah? And plot one is the bit where the station is and above the station, and plot two is the bit further along, the rest of box park? Uh, no, so plot, plot one is all of this um, building here. So it's, this, it's everything you see here on the model. Plot two is actually the taller of the consented building, which sits slightly south. And Thank we are you. not considering anything to do with plot two. Great. Okay, should we have a look around the um, uh, building? 
Yeah, if you can put the lights on, just remember, um, no questions or anything, because we'll do the questions through the microphone, so it's all recorded, okay? And uh, um, just at this point, anybody at home who's watching, uh, the committee members are just going to look at the architectural model in the middle of the room, but obviously you won't be able to hear them. Okay.
Great. Okay, so we've got uh, we've got sort of two sections here. I think um, one is to um, ask slash have any comments about um, the specific um, changes that have been uh, been made. So that's around the sort of slight alignment within the the design alignments within the um, minimum and maximum envelopes. Um, you've got the thing about the um, moving it closer to the uh, box, um, but still without the exclusion zone. Um, lobby space inside, um, curvature on the outside. And then the second um, sort of part of this is whether remembering this is pre-app, do when that comes back, do we want to see this again on the basis of just these amendments that we're doing? So do you want to, has anyone got questions or comments? No, great. Um, so <laughs> I think the, uh, the only question I have is around the, um, around the, the sort of TFL box. And I suppose, you know, the, the item, at the end of the day, I suppose if it's, if it's within the safety and the sort of relative, you know, the, the standards that they would want you to see, would want to see, then I suppose that's fine. Just the question of why was it set that, uh, why was it set sort of slightly differently for the purposes of this design? Or I process? Really, I don't really know. I okay. think I, my understanding, and someone else might correct me, but there was a, there was a previous model, if you like, form, mm -hmm. and the maximum minimum, minimum parameters was just set around that form, and whatever it happened to do around the TFL box was what got locked in. You know, but it's not what it necessarily needs to do to make it successful. Mm -hmm. So, okay. to, to your first statement, I think that there is an offset from TFL of two meters we have to respect, which deals with sort of safety and access and all of those things. So that that's that's done. Mm -hmm. We can build or put things within it that are temporary. So, you know, some of our screening elements will have to be temporary so they can be re removed, I think, once every year and then once every five years for maintenance. But but that's it. But uh, we, what we don't want to see is this hole, yeah. you know, this sort of five meter hole around the station. Okay, fine. Yeah, Councillor Young. What? I think there's probably two offices. I don't know. Uh, what proportion of the office space is going, is going to be affordable? I don't think we're doing that. We don't know yet, but we know where it's going to go, which is essentially in the tenth part of the bottom. Have you guys got that figure? Because we haven't yet um, seen those, that area schedule. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can answer it's not material. Yeah. In, in terms of as a percentage, it's um, it was agreed that seven and a half percent of the area would be discounted, sixty percent in Hackney. Okay. So we, we've quickly looked at it. It's, it's about three thousand square meters will be discounted at sixty percent in Hackney, and Tower Hamlets is a slightly different discount of ten percent of their space at a ten percent discount because of the borough. Okay. Um, without um, wanting to rake over a sort of a very, very long and involved process on this, because obviously it falls in within my ward, so it's, I've been involved in some of the moving around polystyrene blocks previously. Um, the, you know, it's a, a essentially, it's also a strategic site, so GLA gets um, uh, gets to sign off and all, no matter what we or what okay. our say. Um, quite a lot of housing, so it's, it does have housing. I think all of the housing is in um, Tower Hamlets. Um, we get the office, we get more office space, you know, this is sort of, this has gone through various iterations over 20 years, maybe oh longer, goodness. who knows. Um, so this sort of, you know, it, without wanting to sort of say, let's not get into it, let's not get into too many of these questions because it's a huge, huge but just, source of Just one on the, space. it's been going for 20 years. So in the last 20 years, the need for office space has rather changed. Um, where are we at with thinking that we really need all this office space there now? Well, I mean, it's still priority it's office still space in Shoreditch, isn't it? So, I understand you know. it's still our policy, but our policy I'm going to the office four days a week because I don't have to pay for my heating at home. <laughs> um, I'm not entirely sure that this is the place to get into that. It is a priority office area, and this would deliver a lot of office space um, to go to meet the need that is identified in the local plan. And once this has been provided, perhaps some of the other other sites could provide something else, but maybe not more detail than that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Great. Any other specific questions on curvature um, or envelope space or anything like that? No. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Um, the second, we like curves. Thank you. Good. 
Um, there's just a second um, uh, part of this, I think, Nick, is whether we delegate this, these specifics back to you or whether we want to see it back here. I would highly recommend we just delegate this to the officers to deal with because it's, it's very technical um, sort of architect's drawings. Um, all those other, let's do a quick vote. Um, all those in favor to delegate to officers, hands up. Uh, that's your analysis. Okay, fine. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for coming in um, and for taking time. It's a beautiful model. So that's great. Um, have a good evening. Uh, right, just if we finish off um, ourselves, um, we've just got um, that's it, isn't it? So just, yeah, future meeting, 6th of December for a full yep. planning yep. meeting. Great. Thank you very much, members. Thank you very much, officers. Thank you, Mario Online and everyone else that's joined us. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you.